And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OPA 2021 Annual Oakville Film Festival. This is our eighth year uh, for the festival. It is my fifth year with the festival, year number two virtual. But, uh, you know, we are enjoying the, the positives and the negatives of going virtual. We get to see everyone from around the globe. This is actually an international screening, so that's really amazing. Um, so thank you to everyone who is watching and who is uh, screening our films. Uh, just a quick note, um, Red Balloon, we did have some technical issues. Apologies for that. Um, you know, we're still iron ironing out some, uh, some quirks and kinks, but if you um, could want to rewatch it, we've posted the sound. So it's all ready to go. So make sure you rewatch Red Balloon, an amazing short that was um, part of today's special. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, who uh, bring this festival to life and bring films to life. You know, without funding, uh, film wouldn't uh, be where it is. So thank you to our sponsors who make this happen. Uh, thank you to our filmmakers who share their hearts and share their stories and tell us these stories that are, are so necessary for us to hear. Um, thank you for inspiring new filmmakers uh, to, to create as well. Um, you are an inspiration for so many. Uh, thank you to all of our cast and crew who attend our Q and A's and who are part of production. Um, and now thank you to the OPA board members. You guys do so much work to bring this festival to life. Um, some of it, you don't get a thank you, but we are very, very grateful for all of your work. Uh, Wendy, you do so much. We appreciate all of your work. Tori, thank you for being here virtually. You are uh, our behind the scenes uh, tech lady and we are so grateful for you and to everyone who has a helping hand in the festival, we thank you. Now to the viewers, this is for you and we are so grateful to have you here, uh, tuning in on this rainy, mm -hmm. wet day, uh, perfect movie day if you ask me. So thank you for showing up and supporting our festival. Next, um, I would just like to remind you, please, please vote for the Audience Choice Award. There's a scale from one to five, one being a lower score, five being the highest score, and you can vote for your favorite shorts and you can vote for features. So you can actually vote on all of them. You don't just have to pick one. Um, so make sure you get those votes in. We really, really appreciate it. Um, one fun part about this virtual Q&A is the audience, you can get engaged as well. So please do not hesitate to ask some questions in our chat. I think it's on this side. Uh, so post the questions in there and I'll be able to ask our filmmakers and our guests today some of your questions that you've been uh, wanting to know. So uh, that's it for the reminders. I just want to now introduce all of our wonderful guests. Uh, first, I'll introduce director Jim Morrison IV, who brought us Obdurate. Hello, Jim. How are you? Oh, he's muted. That's okay. We'll just get away. Right. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Um, next, we have director, writer, and screenwriter, uh, producer, Vanya Rose. Thank you so much for being here, Vanya. She brought us Woman in Car, this amazing feature um, that we were all just so lucky to see. And uh, we'll get a little bit more into that. We have two stars from Woman in Car. We have Gabrielle Lazor. Hello, Gabrielle. She plays hey. Charlotte. And we have Aiden Ritchie, who is here, who Hello. plays Owen. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. And our last guest, we have Nick Hudson. Now, Nick, we you have an interesting uh, role in today's uh, in today's discussion. You know, you work for the Edith, Edith Wharton. Uh, Edith Wharton House, and I think we just, let, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do over there, and uh, we're just, we're just really excited to have you. Yeah, so yeah, I'm a research assistant at Edith Wharton's home in Lenox, Massachusetts, it's called The Mount. It was a summer cottage, you know, she really built and designed herself, um, lived here really about nine years before moving to Europe, where in 1911, where she, really she spent the rest of her life. Um, but, you know, we're a house museum, so, you know, if you're ever in the Berkshires in Massachusetts, it's sort of the western part of Massachusetts, feel free to visit, you know, our grounds are open, um, we are giving tours of the house, too, so, okay. and, yeah, for research assistants, you know, I work on exhibits, um, and really just any question that arises about Wharton or her works. 
Perfect. Well, thank you for being here. Um, for our viewers, uh, Woman in Car was inspired by Edith Wharton novel, The Reef. Um, so why don't we get a little bit into that, Vanya? I'd love to hear um, how The Reef transpired into this beautiful screenplay and to this beautiful film. Um, well, I've always liked her work. I'm always a big fan of Edith Wharton. I just fell on her novel, which was like, you know, a dollar, the dollar rack of a bookstore. And I hadn't heard of it even or read it. And so, um, and so once I read it, I was just kind of blown away by its um, kind of modern contemporary feel. And originally the script was quite close to the novel and it was also a period piece. And then it just slowly through the years, kind of as I started working on it, I just, I really felt this contemporary vibe for it. And so it really evolved into a contemporary film and then changes took place just you know just my own thoughts kind of took over especially regarding Owen's character Aiden's character and so slowly it just kind of transformed into this very different kind of story um you know very much with the same um socioeconomic kind of setting um except in Montreal and uh it's, you know so the characters names are basically the same um and there's you know every so often little things will pop up that are similar um, you know, certain character traits for sure um, are in there, but basically the plot took on a very different, um, a very different, um, you know, path. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it all happened. I haven't read the book, but I'm sure it was a really wonderful adaptation. Um, Nick, you have read the book, The Reef. Um, were there some surprises or some interesting parts that you, that you saw in the film that maybe uh, you weren't expecting that weren't in the book? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, I think Vanya likes to say it's inspired by the reef. Yeah, because you know it's not a strict ad adaptation. Um, like the both the reef, it mostly focuses on um, you know Anna, and then in the movie the character David um, is you know so man you know going to marry Anna, but he has an affair with or a little fling with Sophie, you know, sort of on his way to, you know, propose and, you know, that basically sets everything in motion and, you know, kind of blows up in everyone's face because, you know, as in the movie, Sophie, you know, becomes engaged to Owen and it just gets very, very messy. <laughs> uh, so you know, there's sort of been a change of focus, which is, I think is really neat, um, you know, away from that to focus, you know, obviously more on Anna and Owen um, and, presumably their child. Um, that's the one thing I, I just absolutely love. There wasn't just, you know, one plot. It was several plots, several feelings, and even each character had this duality to, a, to them, you know, almost like several characters in one. Um, just an incredible job, Vanya. Really, really, really good. Um, we do have an audience question already from Mary. Uh, amazing film, fourth time watching. My question is for Miss Rose as a producer. What was your favorite scene or one of that challenged you the most? So many gut-wrenching moments. Congrats to all of you. Yes. <laughs> um, my, what was the question? My favorite scene or the most challenging? Uh, what was your favorite scene or the one that challenged you the most? Oh God, yeah, that is hard. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's silly challenging things, you know, like props and the silly stuff which makes scenes challenging as a director with so little budget and hardly anyone on set you know so the stuff like that which was challenging but I would say my favorite scene and and it was challenging when the time came was probably the confrontation between Owen and um, Anne in the garage 93 I think <laughs> 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 I'm better known as 93 no, I, can't I think it was 93 um, yeah, we just, um, you know, it was a really intense moment too, because we were in this very, um, you know, it was set in Westmount, which is a very um, wealthy neighborhood, and we only had a limited time to shoot in that neighborhood. Um, but then I found out on top of having to stop at nine o'clock that we actually had to end at eight o'clock, like an hour earlier. And I had just, you know, in my kind of state of just, you know, creation, um, <laughs> hadn't even noticed this on the like timesheet. <clears throat> and totally had forgotten about it that I had this le you know hour less of shooting so in my head I was kind of like you know marking out how I was going to get through it 
So when I, you know, I was like, someone told me finally, oh, you know, we ended eight. And I was like, wow. So that was a big shocker. And then, yeah. And then it was just, you know, it's such an important scene, that scene. And thank God the actors, you know, um, are what they are. And, you know, we'd worked on it. And, um, but it was just, you know, Helene and I had this kind of moment which was, you know, which had to get us to the next level, which is kind of this like screaming moment we had between each other, which is just, you know, I can't do it. Yes, you fucking, excuse me. Yes, you, you know, it was one of those moments. Uh-huh. Um, and poor Aiden had to stand there and watch us, you know, until we kind of got it, you know, and then she kind of, and then she just turned around and just kind of did it. And it was like, thank God, you know, it was just kind of sometimes the actors, they just get, you know, there's moments that it happens to directors too, to any creative, creative process where you're kind of just stuck and you can't so we were kind of in this kind of moment of kind of being stuck and we just had to get through it and so we got through it and and I literally went home um you know and I literally edited it like I went home and edited it like I, it was like I don't know what time we got home that night like nine and I just sat in my room and just edited it and I think the edit is almost exactly the same <laughs> as the final film but I just had to make sure I got it because we left that set that day and I was just like oh my god I mean Hayden was in the car with me and I was just like oh my god I can't believe like I just uh, I hope we got it anyway I went home and edited it and we got it and then we were okay but yeah that was probably the most challenging See, these are these are the the moments that I love about the Q and A's. You know, we have these, these people watching who maybe are thinking about getting into film, and it's so great to hear the background and what goes into creating a film, the struggles, the obstacles, and you know, seeing it through the difficult times, um, and then what you create in the end. It was just so amazing. Um, we have another question for you, uh, oh. Vanya. Uh, the is the original character in the Reef an archer like Anne? No. No. Okay. No. She's not. Any- was a, did archery come into play later on? Is that something uh, close to you? No, I mean, apart from being a Sagittarius. Um, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I've always liked archery. I've never done it. Um, you know, it's always been something that's interested me. Um, but definitely at, the, at that time, um, you know, women did arch. I mean, it was one arch did, you know. Um, it was kind of a pastime that certain women of a certain, um, you know, class did, you know, Nick was, we were talking about it the other day and just how in other novels it pops up, which I hadn't even thought about, to be honest, um, in other Wharton novels. Um, but it was important for me that Anne had like a passion. That was, um, something I really wanted her to have, which she doesn't have in the novel, unless I'm forgetting something. Nick. <laughs> no, I don't think she, no, no, that, yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Say. So I had to really, I really wanted her to have um, something, you know, I had to develop something of her own. Um, and I got really into the idea of the athlete. I mean, the athlete, I really kind of started obsessing about, but just, I did a lot of research on athletes and just, you know, they're very similar to artists, you know, in so many ways. And they have these incredible passions. They make no money. They are obsessive like us. They're, you know, they're career driven. They, you know, and um you know, the government gives them some stipends and they basically are like surviving. They're, a lot of them are living at their parents. A lot of them are have three jobs. And then of course there's the personality of the archer, which is just this very interesting, when you start to meet archers, you realize, holy shit, you know, this is like people who are very, um, you know, it's like golfers. They have that part of their brain that's developed to be able to fix a point that no, no normal person, you know, I'm mean, like normal, whatever that means, you know, can, barely see with a naked eye and yet for them they're aiming for it and they get it I mean we're talking about you know a point that is so far like I couldn't see it for the life of me and yet you know the woman I the young woman I worked with since she was you know almost eight years ago I started filming her she ends up being in the film the young archer at the end of the film Virginie who's like you know headed towards the Olympics she was just incredible you know and just this personality type you know very driven very um you know, almost tunnel vision and this kind of very, you know, most of them are kind of introverted, not very big talkers, a very specific personality type. And so it suited Anne perfectly. It was like this woman who, you know, isn't able to open up, who's very driven, who's, it just worked out really well for her. And of course, someone who gave up a passion to kind of, you know, be in the money. 
Um, let's unpack that the athlete part of it. You know, when uh, Charlotte says, oh, we have an almost Olympic athlete uh, amongst us, uh, you know, Charlotte. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to she news that line for great fun. Uh, Charlotte, you, uh, you were that, uh, that interesting character, almost like a villain, you know, and, and you can see the shame that she feels like, oh, of course you have to say almost, um, <laughs> why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, about that character, Charlotte, and, uh, maybe some difficulties that you had playing it. Well, actually, yeah, it's interesting what you're saying, because it's, it's true. When I read it already, I thought, wow, this person is not very nice, you know, <laughs> and it's, uh, they always say the best roles are the ones of bad guys you know so I'm like well it means it must be very interesting <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know despite that you still somehow have this feeling of course an actor and the character he plays is different every time it's we put a little bit of ourselves in it our our heart and soul and you know everything but it's not us but somehow we still have this you want to please, you want people to like you, you know, and I, at first I was kind of playing it. Also in France, actors tend to, to act a little bit more, um, let's say restrained, more kind of discreet, subtle kind of way of, uh, of working. And in American or Canada, whatever, it's, it's maybe more organic, more uh, extroverted somehow. So when I first arrived on the film set, uh, it was that scene when you first see me at the birthday, um, Vanya said, "No, no, no! You have to, you have to go more. <laughs> you, you have to." She, she wanted it. She wanted Charlotte to be more, um, more intense. You know, more uh, to really express that kind of uh, violence. And then I figured, well, yeah, of course she's got. She is someone. Uh, the character Charlotte somehow sacrificed her own life too. We had imagined when you when you take on a character as an actor, generally you kind of invent all these things for yourself. That, that are not even in the story, but you just kind of feed yourself with things to, to motivate you, stimulate you, whatever. And so I'd imagined that maybe, you know, she never had any children of her own and maybe she, she was into women, but she couldn't do that at the time with the social pressure or for whatever reasons, she was not a very happy woman, obviously. So, um, so yeah, she can't, comes out like that, and uh, and she wants she needs to control everything. I think a lot of the, what the, a lot of the characters have in common is a some kind of issue about control, you know, each in their own way. Well, thank you. I mean, I hurt people, hurt people, right? And uh, I think you you did such a great job at at, at showing us that that side of Charlotte. Um, Aiden, let's move on to you. We have a, a question for you. You know. Your, your character, you know, in the beginning, you're not sure if you should hate him or if you should like him. Uh, Owen had such a range of emotions and feelings. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some challenges you had playing Owen. Um, well, I, I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind would be the one scene where uh, I think Owen leaves the apartment after Sophia um, I guess, found out. I, I, it didn't make it in the final cut, but she walks in on Owen and uh, Anne, right. you know, uh, getting intimate in the kitchen. And so Sophia had walked in on that. And then there's a scene where he's, he's in the apartment. And <laughs> I don't know. I, he, he, in general, he, he, he was a, a difficult character to play, I guess, because... Um, well, because because of exactly what you just said is that there like there's all that range of emotion, not only that, that range of perspective, because Vanya, you know, and I would have this argument where she'd be like, she left, he left, he left his daughter, you know, he left her. He's an asshole. Sorry. He's a jerk. I never said that. I never <laughs> said he's an asshole. When he was well, just she did <laughs> Well, there was there was a bit of a thing about like judging him, and I and I, I well I, I maybe it was in my head, Vanya. I don't know. Maybe I had that in my head. <clears throat> all right. Good motivators. <laughs> As a writer, yeah. I love. Yeah, but all it, my it, he, he was he, he was difficult, I guess, because uh, you know there it was for one, it was like you know being a prairie boy. It's like um, you know going to Montreal 
learning about you know Westmont and these characters and the history of the people like that that was a whole thing outside of my understanding of, of people of society so um it was challenging but it was so exciting to learn about this character and and what he did and and um, why he did it and um as well as you know channel everything that vanya wanted to have this character do in the story and um you know when she mentioned the reef and the, the the novel like it definitely gave me a vibe and an idea of okay this is like a this this is this is real cinema this is like real cinema real character you know this is this isn't your typical in my mind you know greco roman hollywood bad guy good guy kind of stuff like this is a real cinema uh, you know piece of art story and that was exciting but also challenging well, you did a phenomenal job. Um, I mean, to, for, for your audience to feel so many different things about one character, um, you, both of you, Gabrielle and Aiden, amazing, amazing job. Um, Jim, let's bring you into this conversation a little bit. Uh, thanks for your patience over there. Um, so Jim's the director of Obdurate. Am I saying that word right? Obdurate? You're saying that word right, yeah. I had to Google it. I was like, what is that? Um, That's great. That's perfect. That was the idea. <laughs> Stubbornly refusing to change one of one's opinions uh, or course of action. That's the definition mm -hmm. I have to look up. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, maybe the title or maybe about, uh, you know, the, the thought of this, this short film? Sure. Yeah, the, the incubation of this short film was I, I was doing some, some work with uh, Cynthia Crowfoot, who's the lead actress, writer, and producer on the project, who's on set today. That's why she's not with us. Um, well, she's with us, but you know, she's not here. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was kind of, I live in LA typically, she's, she's in Oakville and um, uh, we were going back and forth uh, about a feature that she was, she was writing. So kind of helping her with some technical things. And uh, this kind of, she, she either mistexted me or said it kind of joking, or I misheard something and thought she said, uh, text support instead of tech support. I'm like, oh, that's a great title for a film. You know, what if you could just like text across, you know, just for support all the time from somebody. Uh, and then that, that became like the seed and the incubation for this. Like, well, what if you could do that across time? You know, uh, and she ran with the, the idea and it, and it obviously morphed uh, substantially, um, but that was the incubation of it. And then she's got a love of, um, of Stephen King who had a, who had a quote uh, that included the word obdurate in it. And I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what the quote was, but I was like, that's the title of the film because it's just obscure enough that, you know, people that are very literal, literate will, will know it. Uh, it doesn't tilt the hand, but it still uh, ties, into the, ties into the film. So that's how we, that's how we incubated the, the project. Beautiful. I mean, that word, it's, it's definitely a, a new word for some, but uh, to finally understand like what you were trying to get across in the short. I mean, just so many themes. Um, I mean, we have an audience question that was, how did you come up with this idea? But, um, you know, they said, Obdurate is an incredible film about both domestic violence and the woman who gets the chance to change her life and not make a mistake. Um, so I, I just love that, that voicemail that was like beyond time, warning herself, um, mm -hmm. just, just so well done. Uh, really, Thank really you. cool. Um, we have another question for, who's this question for, Vanya? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is from Bebo. Uh, I'm interested in what it's like to make a movie that's inspired by a book rather than directly adapting it. How does that work? Um, I think it's, I mean, I think, um, hmm. I think generally I'm working on a new script now that has not, that's not an adaptation at all. Um, and I've worked on other scripts. Um, Aiden and I were working on something at some point um, that, aren't, that aren't adaptations at all. Um, I would say that it's actually easier to not adapt in general. Like I find adaptation is, I've done, when I was doing theater, I also did a lot of adaptation. I actually even did like my honors thesis on adaptation. So I'm actually like, <laughs> when I think about it now, um, you know, adaptation is kind of like a very interesting concept for me. Like the idea of taking something that's written and making it oral, and there's a whole process there, which is fascinating about orality versus the, you know, all these ideas. 
Um, so the whole concept is, is fascinating, <clears throat> but it's, yeah, it's definitely, I've worked a lot with Virginia Woolf and stuff. And, you know, I used to, I mean, I did a play where I literally was on the floor cutting pieces of paper, you know, like just so that I could see what I was doing. And I had like an entire room covered in pieces of paper that I would then kind of move around. It was like crazy, just because I had to visualize it. So, you know, adaptation is very complicated and it can get complicated because your possibilities are endless. And yet at the same time, you know, how far do you take an adaptation? What does that mean? And like, like in this case, what is the, is it actually an adaptation though? You know? um, so it's a, I would say it's a complicated process. It's very inspiring if you, you know, obviously it takes you, I'm not someone I would say, I mean, I'm definitely a director who writes and produces. I'm not a writer who directs or, you know, I'm definitely a director. <laughs> so writing for me is not, you know, I'd rather have my teeth pulled, for instance, I think, than write personally. Like, that's just my person. <laughs> like, I find it grueling. You know, it's a painful state. So it's not my natural state. So it's nice to have inspiration um, and stuff. But um, but it's very difficult. You know, it's a really it's a really painful process because you, uh, the adaptation process, because, you know, you're you're just having to kind of figure out how much you want to keep and take and without, you know, without insulting the author, you have to think about the author, what the author would want. So it's, it's like, there's many layers to go through. Whereas when it's your own work, you just kind of you just do whatever you want, right? You just kind of, so there's pros and cons, you know, to both of those processes, just different, you know? Thank you. Um, we actually have the Stephen uh, King quote for you, Jim. Uh, the past is obdurate for the same reason a turtle's shell is obdurate because the living flesh inside is tender and defenseless. Um, oh. So good. Um, now maybe we can, you know, bring that into, you know, the vulnerability of women. And I think uh, both films really show the strength and vulnerability of women, uh, Jim or Vanya, maybe you wanna speak to that and, and what you were trying to show in your films. You can take that one first. <laughs> no, you go ahead, I just spoke. <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, you know, I think I think because Cynthia wrote this film, she had a lot of, you know, um, um, had an intimate connection to the material uh, because she she birthed the material, so to speak. Uh, you know, I think as a as a director, the most challenging thing is to make sure that you are supporting your actors and not exploiting them, especially in these really vulnerable types of scenes. Um, so. Uh, you know, Cynthia and I worked together uh, for many years and, and have a good good relationship that way. So it was a really, for me to direct that kind of scene, it was a it was a really wonderful opportunity to work with somebody that I had a kind of uh, long term relationship, not long term relationship, long term um, creative relationship with, uh, and somebody who was already already had access to the. Um, emotionally, intellectually, creatively, artistically to the, to the material. Thank you. Kwani, anything you want to share? I mean, yeah, I mean, when you're a woman and you're writing on, you know, it's like, it's just you. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Women is like, there's not really, there's no, um, you know, it's just, it's just reality, you know, it's just our lives. So it's hard to have pers perspective on, on like what makes it a female, um, story or it's just, you know, it's just, that's it. That's our, that's our lives. It's just how women are. Um, and I tend to, I mean, I love writing for, for men also, actually, I, I really love it, but, um, you know, probably all my films, except for maybe one, um, you know, they're all female lead characters just because that's, that's who I am, you know? And so it's just how it goes. <laughs> Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, you know, um, you know, it's just how, you know, it's just our natural attraction as to our own sex, I guess, from our perspective. So, yeah, I don't know if I can see from okay. any other perspective. Okay. I mean, apart from humanity. I mean, I think, you know, the human, the fact is that human, you know, at the same time, humanity is, you know, we're very similar in many ways, you know, so, you know, Owen's character, I felt very close to, you know, Owen's probably the closest character to me in many ways, you know. So I don't really, you know, we, we speak through women because that's our voice maybe, but I don't know if the human experience, apart from some, you know, 
situations that are very specific. You know, we all love, we all hate, we all are jealous, we all are bitter, we all are, you know, you know, all these emotions are very, we all share, you know, so. Thank you. Um, Nick, let's, uh, let's chat with you a little bit. Um, so Edith Wart Wharton, uh, an amazing writer, she was the first woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for literature in 1921. Um, you know, she, she wrote some amazing works and filled with themes. Um, maybe you want to talk about some of the themes um, from other Edith Wharton novels that you were, you were seeing in the film. Uh, well, I, I mean, actually, to start with like the most obvious one, um, there's a lot of books of hers which have these sort of almost incestuous relationships. You know, for instance, there's The Mother's Recompense, which is about, you know, mother, she left her, her husband and, you know, with their daughter, moved to Europe, um, ended up having an affair with a man who then um, later becomes engaged to her daughter. Or... You know, Summer is another book of hers where, um, you know, a, a woman's raised by sort of a stepfather type figure. Um, and I, I guess it's over 100 years later, so I can spoil the ending. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, that, Spoiler alert, it's 100 years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, I mean, she spends most of the novella, you know, trying to get out of this small town and um, ends it um, being married to her sort of stepfather. Uh, so... Yeah, and I think there are reasons more than just sort of like, you know, that shock about incest other than, you know, it's shocking. I think it has a lot more to, my interpretation would be one of her themes is about how um, men treat women like children and how, the, you know, they may be even kind of attracted to that or at least women they think are like children. It almost never ends well for the man who thinks a woman's like a child and he can shape her, but you know, that would be another theme, <laughs> which I guess you can see in the movie too, because um, I'm sure Fraser did not see it coming, you know, when it actually did, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, now, if, if anyone else has any questions for each other, um, we can do that as well. No one? That's all right. Um, the uh, rabbit scene, uh, Vanya, the skinning the rabbit right in the beginning, that scene, I was like, whoa, oh my goodness. And it's like, it's shocking to, to watch. And, you know, it's one of the first few scenes in, in the film and you're, you're not sure how to take it, but the, you know, you want to look, but you can't look away. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about that rabbit scene. It was dead. Of course. <laughs> you didn't kill it. <laughs> you didn't kill it. We had two rabbits. We had a live rabbit and we had a dead rabbit. In terms of human you know, contact with. Um, so um, what can I say about the rabbit scene? That was a very cold day, right? Aiden, Jesus Christ. We were running yeah. through the uh, mess. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very cold. That was when we did that whole, oh, it was a very cold, cold day. Um, what can I say about the rabbit scene? I, you know, when I write, when I mean, I'm sure like when anyone writes, it's kind of like a very subconscious flow thing. Um, and so, you know, the rabbit, symbol the rabbit, I mean, was it Sophia? Is it, you know, is it Emma? You know, I mean, for me, you know, um, is it herself? Is it Anne? Is it, you know, is it, you know, who does the rabbit represent? I mean, I think it just, it was nice to put that in there despite everyone being, <laughs> freaked out. Um, it was nice to have that in there because I think it just showed, you know, it brought into at the beginning of the film a kind of a violence that mm -hmm. the film maybe has in it, an underlying violence, which Anne could have potential, you know, potentially have or um, which potentially is there throughout the film. And so it was a nice kind of just foreshadow of any, you know, of any of that kind of feeling to the film. Um, oddly enough, when we were on set, I've learned that there's a few Quebecois films that have the skinning of rabbits. And I'm starting to wonder, um, you know, if that's just in my DNA at this point. <laughs> Supposedly, well, in yeah. French films, in, in France, there's quite, quite a few films that show that as well. Yeah, I, it's interesting. It's like a French, theory, you know? Yeah, and I did watch a lot of French <laughs> films in my life. So I don't know, maybe there's something in there, just like an imagery that's remained in my, in my cultural um you know background but um yeah and there was something about just preparing and 
um, you know, the whole aspect of preparing the meal for Owen and what that was about. And um, yeah, there's lots of stuff. There's lots of layers there for sure. Lots of, uh, but I guess but the violence. Definitely too. sets the tone for the film though. It does yeah. give intensity right from the beginning. Yeah. Absolutely. And even with that, the car wash scene of, you know, the I love that's my favorite scene is the car wash scene. Yeah. I love that scene. It's so, so symbolic. It's such a beautiful image, you know, for the character. Absolutely. You're hearing the stuff about the church and, you know, not going to a service, but then it's kind of like her, her, her baptism, you know, her, her, yeah. her washing away the sins. It was just really, really well done. Um, spoke volumes for sure. Um, Nick, um, we have another question about uh, class restrictions in Montreal for, for this film versus, you know, at the time Edith Wharton was, was writing, you know, are, are they similar? Oh, <laughs> I don't know enough about Montreal to <laughs> really say. Um, yeah, I, I, actually, this is perhaps a difference um, between the book and the movie. Like, there is, um, like Henry James was a good friend of Edith Wharton and he actually really loved the, the novel, um, but he made one criticism, which is that he didn't feel like she took advantage of the French environment that, you know, this could have happened, you know, in Boston or New York or London or, or any place. Um, while, you know, in the novel, it's these, you know, American expatriates, it's, you know, all taking pl place, mostly in France, a little bit in London. Or, or in England. Um, so, but uh, just from watching the movie, it did seem that, you know, they, and actually talking with Fania that it's very closely um, tied up with, you know, Montreal society and, you know, different um, aspects of, you know, I guess different classes in there. Um, I, mean, I mean, well, I guess but I would say that the Sophie character in the book does come from sort of a more aspiring class than you know, the, the other main characters who are firmly establishing sort of the wealthy upper class. Okay, thank you. Um, Vanya, maybe just one more question about the title. So Woman in Car, um, I mean, several things come up with, with the title, but, you know, maybe the feeling of being confined was was that uh, maybe the, the part you were going, the direction you were going with, with, the, with that title? Uh, well, it's funny, there's a few, there's like many, you know, like all these things, there's many levels, but the first, the first, um, the first time I came up with the title, because it had a different, it had like Montrealers, it had um, As the Night, the Day, which was a Shakespeare line that I really liked, but, um, but finally I fell on Woman in Car. Um, it was actually, I was walking through a neighborhood that I live in, which is called Outremont, which is kind of the French version of Westmount. Um, which is a very wealthy uh, French neighborhood. I live like in the Hasidic poor part, <laughs> but the rich part is, is not far. Um, and, um, and there was, you know, this woman sitting in her car just kind of parked on the side of the road and she had this blonde hair. And, um, and then as I started walking, I noticed more and more that I was kind of seeing these women sitting in cars. You know, as I was walking around, I just I was like, oh, there's another woman sitting in her car just by herself on her phone or you know and then I start to and then just made me start to think about yeah there's like a certain class of women who kind of spend their time just kind of waiting in cars for their kids or you know I don't know the dry cleaners to open or the you know and they just kind of sit there and they're just kind of passing their spending their lives in cars just kind of waiting so that was that was kind of how it first started and then we were on set and then we, I kind of had this flash, Aiden was there, when I was like, oh, I didn't realize this, but that we had this moment where I kind of ran up to Aiden and Helene and I was like, hey, guess what? I just realized <laughs> like on set, like, you know, you think I'd think of this before we shoot, but that actually Owen and, and Anne had had their encounters while when he was young in the car, in the garage that that's where they had actually, you know, been intimate for most of his childhood, oh, <laughs> his teenager, his teenager. young adulthood. <laughs> um, that, you know, when the dad was alive, they'd meet in the garage. 
and that the piece that he was playing, which is um, a sati piece, which is actually um, that piece he plays with the rabbit, uh, the rabbit scene, and then she comes out, which was actually the reason I loved it was not only did he write it when he was very young, but it was his dad was a music publisher. And it was the first piece that he um, that was published outside of his dad's publishing company. So it was kind of Setsi saying, I'm done, I'm, I'm growing up and I'm gonna go somewhere else. So um, that's kind of, that was kind of their cue. We kind of realized that when he'd play that song, when he was rehearsing, it meant you can meet me in the garage. So uh, we kind of had that, um, we kind of, I kind of had that moment of, oh. And so then it became woman in car. And so, so then there's that moment, like when they're in the garage and he's trying to push her in the car, which was already written in the script, but I just hadn't put it together that that was their place, you know, but it was already written in the script that he's kind of pushing her in the car to kind of get her in the car. But that was their place, you know, which is why it's so touching when he's in the garage waiting for her and, and she's there and, you know, they have that moment because for him, it's like, I want to be in the car with you, you know? And she's like, I can't be in the fucking car with you, you know? But he's just like, you know, I want to go back to being in the car, you know? And so that's the second title, I guess, comes from that. Right, thank you. Um, now that I brought up the car wash, we have another question about the car wash scene from an audience uh, from Mary. Um, how did Miss Joy's car hold up? Did it survive the water? What actors do for their art, LOL? <laughs> Yeah, we actually used Helene's car <laughs> because we had been given this Mercedes. I'd actually convinced, uh, this is such, that was like the weirdest story, but I wasn't going to do the film unless Mercedes Benz gave me a car. I was like, if I can convince Mercedes Benz, someone in Mercedes Benz to give me a car, I will make the film. And I got the call on like September, this amazing man, David Weber, who ran, he, at the time he was the head manager of, um, the, the West Island, they probably shouldn't know this information. Anyway, the West Island, West um, Mercedes Benz on his own, he had a daughter who was a musician. And so he kind of felt like he could, you know, he wanted to support the arts. And I had left this really obscure message. Like I need a car for this film. <laughs> and I wanted it to be a Mercedes. And he's like, I'm gonna find you that car. And I remember I was outside my kid's school and I was on the phone, I'm like, what? He's like, I have until March. I was like, yeah, he's like, I'm going to find you the car. And so I was like, okay, I'm making the movie. That was like, that was how I knew. I said, if I don't get that, I'm not making the film. And so he gave us a car by March. I had a car, which I had to myself for the whole month. So I was driving around and let me tell you, men look at you very differently when you drive around a Mercedes Sure. Than when you're on your bicycle, you probably get a lot more action. I just want to say that right now. <laughs> Mercedes. Yeah. Is the key. Maybe it's that they're like, she's a successful woman. That's super- Yeah, yeah. the gas station, man. It was like, I was like set. It was like, you know, anyway, on that note. Um, so we had this car, but I was like, we can't use this for the car wash scene. Like I can't, I'm going to destroy the car. And so, and then I had the crew on my ass for the entire shoot for the scene. Like you have no clue. I had like, no one wanted to do it. They wanted me to videotape. They want me to film them saying they had no part in the scene so that if the camera broke, they were, you know, covered by insurance, you know, on and on it went. My DP at one point, I love my DP as, you know, everyone knows, but he was like, I'm not going in the car. I was like, are you, I was furious. I was like, this is, and Helene and I were like, we're doing the scene. And Helene said, I'm using my car. And so we did a, we did a practice round with Helene's car. We kind of put garbage bags everywhere. And we were like, we're not that wet. This is ridiculous. So we just had to, at first, because the color, the inside of the car was a different color than Helene. So we had like tape at one point, but the tape, and we did it three times, went through the car wash three times on the day. And we had the car wash people who were freaking out. Anyway, um, we got three times, two inside, and we did one from the, through the window. And like the tape was coming off and it was just like a mess. Wow. Um, but it worked out and uh, and we did. And Helene was great. Helene was like, I don't care, I'm doing it. And so if it wasn't for Helene, we wouldn't have that scene, honestly. I, was, I had this idea of getting a communauté, which is like our public cars. I was like, I'll get a communauté, we'll trash it, and I'll just return it and no one will know who trashed it. <laughs> that was my backup plan. That was backup plan too. If we didn't have a car, I would just trash a public used one and return it. But anyway, it came through. Amazing. It, it just turned out fantastic. Uh, and I love that that she had a, had a role in that and bringing it into her car. So really cool. Did.
Um, we've gone on for quite some time. I think we're going to wrap now. Um, but thank you, everyone who uh, who's, who came today, to our viewers who watched the movies, to our guests who shared um, your stories with us. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to remind you, if you haven't watched Red Balloon because of the technical difficulties, please go back and rewatch it. Really, really great film. Um, and rewatch of the other films as well, Obdurate and Woman in Car, because they're so great. And we, uh, we just loved having them part of our festival. Uh, please don't forget to vote for your favorite film. Uh, you can vote from one to five. We'd really, really appreciate that for the Audience Choice Awards. Thanks again, uh, Nick Hudson for being here, Vanya Rose, Gabriella Zor, Jim Morrison IV, and Aiden Ritchie. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it means a lot that you guys come and out. Nick, and Nick Hudson. And Oh, I, I said Nick first. Thank you. Did you? Oh, I'm so sorry. No problem, no problem. Thank you, everyone. Um, everyone, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Alta. Alita. Thank Bye, Tanya. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 See you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.